how, you know, these magical experiences that happen, special experiences that happen. So this moment when His Holiness looks in your eyes yeah. and you have this recognition. Is this something that um, is always there for you? And, or is this something you need to nurture and, and keep alive in you? Um, I think, I don't feel like I need to actively nurture it. I, you know, it's, maybe it's just being available. That there, there, there has to be something in you. I think that those of us on the spiritual path, we have, we're seekers. We're on the spiritual path because there's something in us that wants to know truth. We know there's something more than what we see we know there's got to be more to light we know that there's an there's an innate knowing and we're we're you know it wants to find this and so when it comes up against something that shows shows it for a moment ah you know there it is yeah you know and i i just think that's the path of of the spiritual seeker mm. and i do think that there has to be some kind of karmic background because not everybody has this not everybody has this quest or this drive, you know, that causes you to maybe make radical life changes because it's a priority for you, you know, and, and you kind of make lifestyle choices based on that. You might not choose to have the kind of secure conventional lifestyle, you know, because you this drives you, right? So I, I think the drive it is, of a seeker. <laughs> it's the drive of a seeker. Yes. Like Kelwa or something, maybe into it. Mm. Yeah. yeah, you know, and then when you're born in a culture like America that you know doesn't often recognize this, at least, at least not. I mean, I'm a boomer, you know, I was born in 1960, you know, so this is in the 70s, you know, when I was sort of yoga and meditation were first coming, you know, so it. There was a lot of curiosity about it, but it wasn't a given that we understood, mm. you know, this quest. So, so you have this space in this retreat and this teachings, and then, so then, you know, everyone goes home after <laughs> teachings, and and so what do you do? Because your life has changed significantly. Yeah, yeah, my life has changed. So yeah, I guess we're back to this. Are we going back to the story? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so, hmm, yeah, then my life is falling apart. Then I, then I did visit Maryland, and that was in January. And meanwhile, I'm working out this thing with my son and his father for him to, let's see what it's like until Christmas for him to live. Like, that was a big deal, because um, for me to let go of this, you know. And, but I recognize, he was 12, and I felt, you know, he really needs his father in his life now and his father was for the first time in a position to be a full-time parent so the timing of that was mm -hmm. i i kind of recognize he also has a timing and he also has this kind i can't cling to this you know and out of fear and i had there was a certain amount of trust i had to do so by christmas time it was pretty clear that he was pretty happy there and i went to maryland and i came back and was like okay i'm moving to maryland that's what it was. It was like, you know, everything that was important to me here in Burlington, Vermont, is just kind of left, and I'm moving. So I did. I moved to Frederick, Maryland. I didn't know anybody, you know, had, didn't really know what I was going to do for work, and I just got very involved in this in the Dharma Center there in the Drikunkagi Center. At that time, um, Kenshin Kontra Gelsen was the spiritual director, but he was also getting ready to leave. And a, new, a, a young lama was being sent from India um, to uh, replace him and be the spiritual director. But I got very involved, and I got very involved in text projects. I took over a text project, and I started a publishing company. I just got myself very busy with all these yeah. activities and, and had the great good fortune to, you know, many wonderful teachers. And then Garjan Rinpoche came to America mm. in 1996 for the first time and I had the privilege of being among those first students when he we were first doing retreats in Tucson this is before he got the land in Prescott 
And that was so precious, really, really powerful. And of course, you know, Onto Rinpoche and Lumshin Gelbo, many wonderful teachers I had the great. So it was a real download, you know, a very intense download. And I was like a sponge, you yep. know, I was I was there and I was a sponge. And then I met Jetsun Ma Tenzin Palmo, mm. who came to America to do a tour because she was raising money for her mon her nunnery. And she came to our center and I spent several days with her and that was so powerful for me to be in the presence of a Western woman yeah. where I felt the same kind of presence I felt from these Tibetan men. Yeah. <laughs> it impacted me very greatly. You know, it was like, oh. we don't realize that there is a little distancing when it's a different culture there's a little part of us it's like well I, that's for them but could i ever do that you know yeah. yeah but when you you know so spending time with her was powerful and that was the impetus for me to want to be ordained that that was the trigger that that woke up in me that i okay i i really want to do this yeah. and um and so I think Kenshin was kind of waiting for me to say this because he immediately was like, okay, in two days, we're going <laughs> to... <laughs> okay. How long, how long since you'd met Kenshin Rinpoche to this, this moment? Um, like two years. Two years, okay, yeah. yeah. So two years. Wow, wow. Yeah, yeah. And, and so you, you got ordained. Yes. Then I took Getsuma vows. Yeah. I took Getsuma, and I was. That was another powerful, profound experience. I, I felt like a very different per after that ordination, which again is the transmission of these lineage, right, all, all the way from Shakyamuni to you. It had a very profound effect on my mind, and um, like I, I had this mental clarity that I just never experienced before, and. It was it was very powerful, to, um, and I it, it was um, yeah <laughs> another you know sort of blessing stream coming yeah. you know, and um, yeah so and then I met Lama Tao. <laughs> <laughs> so I was deeply immersed in this monastic Drikong tradition and and we were getting many instructions on uh, texts from Lord Jigten Sungo and we had study groups of the Gong Cheek and were yeah. his Mahamudra teachings and I was very immersed in that and yet we didn't really have this emphasis on doing Nundro practice you know there was not the emphasis on that we were doing a lot of short daily practices and mostly studying the texts and understanding the Bodhisattva vows and you know, and getting lots of teachings and things like that. And so I didn't have this idea of a path of practice. I really didn't. It was sort of like the people in three-year retreat do that. It was like to, to have this practice path means you're going into three-year retreat. That was how I came to understand that. Um, so could you say in that system, if you were serious and wanted to be a serious practitioner, you signed up for long-term retreat was yeah. it that sort of feeling yeah yes and absolutely. then if you weren't on that track you were more the helper da around the dharma center type or is definitely it, helper yeah. definitely um involved maybe in translation work and yeah. and academic aspects of it administrative aspects yeah absolutely yeah. got it yeah 